Hey everybody, welcome to For Food's Sake, the podcast bringing you down-to-earth dialogues about the food on your plate and its many impacts on people and the planet. My name is Matteo DeVos, and without further ado, let's talk about food. In this week's episode, I talk with Aaron Kim, the communications director of New Harvest, about cultured meat, which is also sometimes called lab-grown meat or in vitro meat. Now, New Harvest is a nonprofit research institute in the United States that funds and conducts open, public, collaborative research in the field of cellular agriculture. And they're basically all about reinventing the way we make animal products without animals. And Aaron started out as a volunteer at New Harvest in 2014, and while she was still pursuing a, a law degree at the University of Alberta, specializing in environmental law. And today, Aaron and I will be exploring the, the nuances and complexities that surround cultured meat and cellular agriculture, and the prospects uh, of the field in playing a leading role in our diets in the future. And we'll start by talking about the origins, the milestones that have been reached, but also the long road that lies ahead for cultured meat. And in that regard, this episode's really also about separating the media hype around the topic from where the science is currently at. And this transparency and this this honesty uh, is something that, that I think is really important and that's often missing in these types of debates. We'll also, of course, discuss the potential benefits of cultured meat, uh, what it could offer us in the future if it's properly funded and researched, and what role it could then ultimately play in our future diets. I really, really enjoyed this conversation with Aaron, and and I think that New Harvest's message and, and approach to these issues is is one that we can all learn from. So without further preamble, here is Aaron Kim from New Harvest. We have Aaron from New Harvest on the line. Aaron, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Aaron, before we talk all about cultured meat and, and its prospects for it's the future role that it could play in our food system, and, and more specifically about New Harvest and, and what you're doing to, to promote this movement, I thought maybe it'd be best if we start off um, quite simply by, by clarifying a little bit what we mean by cultured meat, uh, talking about some of the terminology and some of the definitions so that, that everyone's on board and everyone knows what we're talking about. So when we talk about cultured meat and cellular, cellular agriculture, what is it exactly that we're talking about? So cultured meat is uh, meat that's grown from cell culture. So um, meat is made up of muscle cells, fat cells, connected tissue, um, blood, and I guess all that stuff. And and so um, cultured meat is basically all of that, but just grown um, through cell culture. Okay. And, and, and is cellular agriculture kind of like the, the broader term then that encapsulates cultured meat and, and, and other forms of of what is what is exactly the difference there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So cellular agriculture includes uh, cultured meat, but it also includes um, other products like um, cultured milk, leather, eggs. Um, it also includes non-animal products. So you can culture, um, you can grow plant cells from culture, and you can grow algae and um, another, basically any any kind of living thing. But um, I guess for like what New Harvest is interested in, um, we're focusing our work on cultured meat because that's the most neglected area of research right now. Okay, and something I saw on your site that I, I, I found particularly fascinating is that, I mean, it could include any animal product, right? It could be not just, yeah. you know, um, meat, but you could be talking about, you know, milk, about eggs, about fur. I even saw rhino horn on there. Yeah. <laughs> so there's yeah. really no limit. Yep. Um. And what it's not is it's not plant-based meat. So um, there's a lot of interesting um, meat substitutes and things like that that are uh, developing. And sometimes it's confusing that people people think that um, we're doing kind of, you know, just veggie burgers. Um, but actually, right. it's totally distinct. So, um, you know, things like the Beyond Burger, which is a, a plant-based burger, are really yeah. cool. Um, and they're appealing to, to meat eaters. Um, and also what can be kind of confusing is that there is a burger out right now called, um, the impossible burger by impossible foods yeah. that has a cell cellular agriculture element to it. Um, 
and how they produce the heme protein, which gives it that like blood-like color. Yeah. Um, but that's only just the one um, ingredient that's produced through cellular agriculture, and then the most of that burger is made out of potato protein. Okay, so, so that's, that's almost like a hybrid. Of, yeah, actually, it, it is kind of, and um, I'd say like the goals are pretty similar, like to these this new, um, you know, all these new veggie burgers that are out there, but the process behind cultured meat is totally different, and then the end product will likely be different too. Mm. Okay, and 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 just just to dwell on this a little further, um, I see it often written as you know in vitro meat or, or lab grown meat or clean meat. I mean, yeah. does this terminology mm-hmm. matter here? Are they all the same or? I think so. So um, I've been involved in um, this field since early 2014. And at the time, um, the two like predominant terms were um, cultured meat and in vitro meat. And once in a while, you see lay people say like lab grown meat or, you know, weird, weird stuff like right. Franken meat sometimes. But yeah. um, over time, I think in vitro meat has kind of fallen to the side. Um, but the word clean meat is kind of the more, it's like a newer, um, phrase that's come, come about. And, um, I think the terminology does matter. Um, cultured meat is sort of the established term and it's the one that's been accepted by the scientific community. And when it's written in, um, the scientific journals and things like that, there's no question about what it means and what it's referring to. And, um, I mean, I, I have, I guess, some concerns about the term clean meat. It's already um, used in, like, in the meat industry right now to describe all kinds of different things. And I've seen it on menus um, and things like that. And so I think it can be kind of confusing for people um, when it's used in reference to cultured meat. Because some people also um, use it to describe the plant-based kind of kind of products, too. So right. um, I like to stick to the term cultured meat. Personally. Yeah, I can... I, I can definitely agree there. I mean, clean meat to me, I, I get the kind of environmental side of it that it it appeals to that side yeah. of cultured meat. But it's like kind of going for the clean energy thing, but yeah. it's it's a bit of a stretch. Yeah, and the lab grown right. meat. I mean, that really kind of does have that almost. I mean, it's more, I guess, for the media headlines. It's a little more sensationalist, yeah. the Frankensteinian element to it. Yeah. It's, but it's not the worst. <laughs> it's not. It's not my favorite term, but it, it could get a lot worse than lab grown, I guess. Yeah. 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 And I, I think it's fading too. I think. Um, I don't. I'm not. I'm not seeing as much of it as there as there used to be. Okay, so we'll stick to to, to cultured meat then. <laughs> hmm. I mean, in terms of, of of kind of where this has come from as, as a movement, uh, cultured meat. I mean, are some of, what are some of the, I guess, the origins of, of where this came about? Um, so this is like so often cited that it's, it's kind of, it's almost like cliche now to bring it up. But one of the first um, mentions of cultured meat was um, in an essay written in the 30s by Winston Churchill called 50 Years Hence. Mm-hmm. And that was probably the earliest um, reference to growing meat outside of an animal. And it wasn't until um, tissue engineering became kind of like an an emerging science um, decades later that people started to think, well, if we can tissue, or if we can culture um, human tissue for medical use, things like skin um, and um, and Organ, other organ tissue um, for medicine, then why can't we do that for food purposes with animal tissue? And it, and so people were thinking about that um, as early as well. I mean, it, it's been referenced in science fiction, like in all kinds of um, works of uh, film and literature and things mm-hmm. like that. But it actually wasn't. There wasn't any actual science happening until probably. 2004, I think, when that this there was a NASA study about culturing goldfish meat to try and see if that was um, like a viable protein source for long-term space missions, um, and that's like to date the only time the U.S. government has ever funded cultured meat research. Oh, and wow. at the time, it was kind of yeah, and at the time, it was um, decided that like it's just too much of a long shot, and so that's why. Um, 
we now, as a nonprofit, are kind of directing the funds, the um, the funds that go towards the open academic research in this area. Yeah, and and I guess maybe indirectly, then I mean, not specifically cultured meat, but there is a kind of overlap, I guess, with like you mentioned, with with growing organs for for human patients, and then also I saw, I mean, for insulin and 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 and, and that yeah. side of it. Yeah, so that's not cultured meat, but it is mm. cellular agriculture, and that's been happening for decades now. And people don't realize that um, cellular agriculture products are already in so many foods that we already eat. So um, just last week, we were at a big food conference in Chicago, and I was actually amazed. Like, you know, you always hear about things like rennet um, being made from um, from cell culture, but I didn't realize mm. also that there are ingredients in like ice cream that mm-hmm. are just, I guess some people have have issues with carrageenan in ice cream. And so um, there are companies out there that produce an alternative to carrageenan. Um, and it is like a, it is a cellular agriculture process um, that they use to produce it. And um, I tasted the ice cream at the conference and it was like, it was it was really good, <laughs> and um, and like yeah, it's just it's probably in most of the ice cream that people eat um, now. And um, there are also things like not not even just rennet, but other enzymes that go into cheese making that um, companies sell to um, to other like cheese producers. Yeah. So it's it's just sort of um, a non obvious but very present. Um, way of producing ingredients that's already very established in the food system, but we're trying to um, use it for for making, I guess, a more com- complicated product, which is meat. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That makes sense. And then, I mean, mm-hmm. just came a, just just thinking about this, but this is still completely different because I think some people might make the confusion here that um, kind of rennet enzymes and and introducing it into ice cream is, is in, in some way genetically modified, but it's it's still a whole different thing to GMOs altogether as well, right? I guess it's important to separate those two, um, or not well, necessarily. I, I, I can't speak for all of those processes. There might be some um, that do have like a GMO element in their production, um, but for culturing meat, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a GMO process. Um, from what we know right now, and I should say I'm not a scientist, and mm. I, I do communications at New Harvest, so I'm exposed to the science, but I myself don't have any scientific training. Um, there are two known ways, at least two known ways, of producing cultured meat, and one of those does involve genetically modifying cells, but then there is another way that doesn't require that. And so um, at this point, it's one doesn't really like beat out the other in terms of like what looks like it's going to be like the method of producing cultured meat in the future, like in at a large scale. Mm. Um, and I don't know, maybe some companies will choose to do it the GMO way and maybe some won't. Um, hopefully there will be like a, like a wide variety of options for people to choose from Yeah, because some people, you know, yes, there are, there is a lot of like mainstream, um, kind of hesitance about about GMOs, but then there's also some people that just embrace it. So I think giving people lots of options and just being honest about it is a good thing. Yeah. And I think you're touching Mm -hmm. upon a really important point too, which we can talk about later, but that's that we're still very much in many respects in the research phase, right? And that although... Totally. Yeah, right. And um, I mean, I saw, I guess, one of the most well-known case studies in popular culture at least is the um is is, you know professor mark post's cultured beef right Mm -hmm. in 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 2013 Uh, could you tell Mm -hmm. us a little bit about that and 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 what that was all about yeah so um when mark post made that first burger in august 2013 um that was like the proof of concept for just the very idea of culturing meat um and so that was funded um by new harvest and also like a one-time uh, fun- like funding from the Dutch government. And mm-hmm. also um, the rumor is that Sergey Brin also provided a large amount of that funding. And, um, and so he, what Mark Poss was trying to do there was just kind of apply already known methods of um, 
of cell culture to to beef muscle cells. Yeah. And so they were able to do that. Um, I mean, it took years, years of work prior to that, but it took a bunch of um, technicians working around the clock to, to take care of the cells, which is a lot of work, as I've come to find out. Um, and um, it, they produced a, like a, I think they produced two patties. One, one of them was like plasticated and put in a museum, and then the other was the one that was um, was tasted live and um, re- reported about and stuff. Yeah, and it, and it cost something like three hundred thousand dollars to make, right? Probably the most. Yeah, so three hundred and thirty thousand dollars in U.S. dollars. Wow, that's definitely the yeah. most expensive burger out there. <laughs> yeah, that we know about. <laughs> Um, and so maybe before we go on to talk a little bit more about, you know, what you do specifically at New Harvest, um, I guess the big looming question is, you know, why are we doing this in the first place? What, what are the benefits of, yeah. of cultured meat? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so all, there are um, potential benefits of culturing meat, and that's why there's so much interest, um, like on the prospective consumer side and also for, from like the scientific community and making it happen. And um, so there's uh, environmental benefits just because it takes a lot of water and energy Mm -hmm. and feed to actually grow the entire animals that are currently um, in the food system for the, for meat purposes. And um, with that also comes all of the ethical concerns about the the billions of animals that are um, killed every year to, to provide meat for the world. Um, it's hoped also that by being able to control um, the environment that the meat is cultured in um, and by eliminating, you know, things like um, the exposure to E. coli and salmonella and, and other kinds of um, things, other kinds of bacteria that sometimes contaminate meat, um, it's hoped that maybe this is a way of bypassing that. Yeah. Um, and then just because you're, you're building... Um, the like you're culturing everything from scratch and um you know there's just more opportunities for for controlling like what goes in and what doesn't go into the meat that maybe it could be um there's potential for like being able to customize it nutritionally and things like that but all of that is it's basically pure speculation because at this point um all any of the prototypes including the burger um, yeah. that have been produced thus far. Um, I mean, they're really exciting and it, it gives people like something tangible to look at and get excited about. But um, because of, um, well, this is, there's a major obstacle in um, cultured meat, which we'll touch on, but because they were produced with um, animal serum as, mm-hmm. a, as like a medium for the cells to be grown in, um, Basically, all of the cultured meat that's been produced thus far has had a higher environmental um, and ethical footprint than even just a regular, like, burger or, a, like, a chicken yeah. piece of chicken that you would just get from slaughtering an animal. Oh, that's really interesting. I never, yeah, because I guess yeah. when you're reading these these articles, it's always hypotheticals yeah. that they're putting in your, you know, and in, 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 yeah. In your, in your face, basically, it's it's looking at if we were hypothetically able to scale all of this, then given these assumptions, exactly. which they obviously don't say, um, you yeah. know, then we would be more environmentally friendly, more ethical, uh, safer, and so yeah. on and so forth. That's that's yeah. really interesting to put a big kind of yeah, I guess question mark over the benefits and that there there's a lot of potential there, but you know, as we'll talk about right. later, there's there's some hype there that we need to address. And and I saw yeah. on, on your website too, um, by the way, which is an awesome website. Just the layout is oh, thank you. is fantastic. Uh, you can spend hours oh, on that. The, the little <laughs> graphs, the little um, I guess they're gifs. I don't, I don't know what they are, but they're, yeah. they're brilliant. <laughs> yeah, just to help people visualize what like you know possibly one of the speculative processes might look like, and yeah. and just to help them get an idea of um, just what what cellular agriculture is visually. Because yeah. um, we don't have a lot of like hard um, like products and, and processes to point to, so exactly. so yeah, those gifts and, and those little illustrations are super helpful. Yeah, they really are. So yeah, I saw that you 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 work with um with Perfect Days, which is I guess one of the companies that is working. It's Perfect Days, right? 
Um, am I getting uh, perfect that right? Day. Yeah, yeah, perfect day. Yeah, perfect day. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and that and that they're looking as well at. And I thought this was interesting to kind of, um, I guess in a way, taking it step by step. I mean, their focus on milk is is about. I mean, I saw this is about reducing strain on the on the industrial system. So not necessarily, you know, saying here we've got an alternative, but that you could even have. And I guess you could have the same with with cultured meat is that you could have a, mm-hmm. a mix of both. Right. Is that you could kind of have an element. So you reduce the environmental strain, but you don't completely replace it. Is that also a kind of avenue right. that cultured meat could take? Yeah, I mean, everyone talks about how it's going to be so difficult to feed, you know, a, a growing population of nine billion, like projected to be nine billion people mm. um, by 2050. And um, you know, a lot that most of those people are going to be meat eaters. And, um, even if the conventional way of producing meat, what, like, even if we wanted for that to be the way to supply the demand for meat, like the, the limits of the planet just cannot, yeah. it, it's impossible for the planet to actually, um, like for the, for there to be enough resources and, and, and that to like actually supply that demand. So, um, so cultured meat, there's a lot of, um, of hope there. And I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, the potential of the benefits is like, it's so out there. I mean, it's reasonable to assume that the, um, the negative impacts would be lessened. It's just that we don't, we just have, we just are, um, accepting that it's been speculative because it's just never been done at scale before. Mm. And so every, everything is like based on calculations of like, if, if it can be produced um, without animal serum and, and like some of the studies, um, which you can refer to on our website, cause we funded, um, we funded one of those studies in 2010. Um, the, the error bars on those things are huge. And so um, it's, there's just so much that's not known. And that's why, I mean, that's one of many reasons why, we're so focused on just getting that scientific research done. Yeah, exactly. I think <clears throat> mm-hmm. I think that's where new harvest is so important, right? I mean, could you tell us, a, you know, I guess what new harvest's main mission is? I mean, is it very much about uh, yeah. not just raising awareness, but about funding too? And yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, it's really interesting because um, new harvest. I, I even had the idea of new harvest being this like big organization you know in like this huge glass building somewhere and i was surprised to find that it was at the time i discovered new harvest um it was just a it was run by isha out of her apartment in toronto you know as one person with like a few dedicated volunteers Mm. and um and so at the time um she new harvest was kind of um i mean it we, we went in different directions and so that included in the beginning um, things like founding Perfect Day and Clara Foods, which is the, another startup that came out of New Harvest, which is working on um, cultured um, egg white, mm. egg white protein, okay. and and that kind of created this like this expectation, I guess, that that's just what New Harvest is always going to do is like create startups. But over time, because I mean, this is such a an unprecedented field and. Like, literally, we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. Um, as, you know, we continue to, to do um, do the work and, and, and certain obstacles became more clear, we just realized, like, basic scientific research is the thing that's missing um, in order for, like, future industries to actually take off and succeed. So we decided to focus on that and... Um, the New Harvest Research Fellows Program came about. We mm. founded, our, or sorry, we funded our first um, researcher in 2015, and that team has now grown to four and and growing. So um, that's our main activity. Um, we're currently a team of two, um, soon to be three, with a new research director who will be coming on in, in a few months. Um, and so the two of us, I mean, we do all the fundraising and all the administrative um, work of funding of running an organization, and we support our research fellows um, as well as doing outreach to just broaden our audience and donor base and um, and things like that. So I guess just the the core activity is funding the research through the fellows program. yeah, um, but then there's also there's also the other 
all the other activities that come from um, being a small nonprofit but aiming to do huge things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like there's a, wa- yeah. a lot of work that needs to be done. Yeah, and I mean, we did face pressure um, along the way to become like a trade organization, you know, or like mm. um, a lobby group and, and all this other stuff. And and I mean, there is going to be a time when stuff like that makes sense but then we just had to face our reality of being a tiny uh donor funded team and and what we can do is we can we can fund um we can just make sure the science happens and um in an open and transparent manner uh and an accessible manner you know give the public updates on how that's going um and attract more scientific interest in the field and of course, more funding. And so um, that's kind of, I mean, that's kind of hopefully the. The focus, like yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's like just the story, I guess, of, of how we came to. Yeah, you, to you, you focus took. Focus on that. You touched upon also transparency, which I think is so important, especially yes. because, I mean, I keep comparing it to to GMOs is kind of another one of those loose terms out there that has a lot of, you know, media headlines and a lot of news around mm-hmm. it. But I think one of the problems mm-hmm. we have there as well is that, you know, even though it's quite widespread now and, and, and even though people aren't necessarily in principle against the idea of genetically modifying um, organisms and plants and whatnot. But I think mm-hmm. one of the main problems there is there's just no transparency. There's no no yeah. real dialogue, or at least not a dialogue that a, a lot of people have faith in. They seem like it's either, you know, you're, you're either taking the side of Mon- Monsanto or you're taking the side of right. of the other extreme. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think it's interesting, too, that the GMO question is like, it's, it's such a frequently asked question. And I think um, there are so many other questions to be asking. So, I mean, is, is this going to be a GMO process? and or product is a valid question, but mm. there are all kinds of other questions that I think people um, can and should be asking about just not even food into the future, but food we're eating now. Mm. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's interesting that, um, I mean, I love ice cream and I didn't realize that there was like a cellular agriculture yeah. component to like so much of the ice cream out there. And like, I wasn't, I wasn't like horrified, but I was just like, Oh, cool. Like, I just didn't know. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and you know, I bet there are probably a lot of people out there who don't realize that, um, that Reddit is now like it, Reddit has been on the market for like, I mean, I think the early nineties. So it's been like 30, almost 30 years. Wow. And yeah, I mean, there's just so many things and maybe that's maybe, I don't know where exactly that problem arises from. Like, is it because um, companies aren't being transparent, like right, like right out of the gates, or is it because consumers don't know what kinds of questions they even should be asking? Yeah. Like, it's kind of like that chicken or the egg problem. I don't know what the source of of it is. But, yeah. Um, and I mean, I guess there's just a growing, like, I guess suspicion of just what big anything is doing yeah yeah and 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 so i mean it does it does make sense that people would have the same um well just you know they would want the same level of scrutiny on like a novel way of producing food Mm. like i I think it makes total sense that people are um you know maybe a little bit wary um and a little bit skeptical or a lot skeptical like i mean i totally invite all of that criticism and skepticism and um and the questions and everything like we totally should be be like um yeah it, it shouldn't be, critical. be easy mm. you know it, yeah it, it, we, we shouldn't be able to just easily push it through without any kind of um any kind of critique I, in my opinion yeah there there needs to oh, be a actually, dialogue absolutely and i should actually mention when i first found out about cultured meat i was disgusted <laughs> <laughs> like I, um, so yeah, when I first read about it, it was through like this novel, um, called Oryx and Craig in like 20, 2005 or something. I was like, maybe still even in high school. Um, and <laughs> I, the idea of cultured meat is like in that book. And I, I literally like 
my stomach turned and I was like, I really hope this never happens and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then I just put it out of my mind and years later, mm. like almost a decade later, um, I came, like I came across just, um, you know, Modern Meadow and New Harvest and, and I realized like, oh my God, like that thing that I read about years ago is actually happening. And I, I think I still had that kind of, um, that icky feeling, but mm. I just, out of like curiosity and I think out of hope too for like what it could um, do for the world. Um, yeah. I got, I just got more interested in actually reading about the science and the actual people behind it. Cause that's a huge part of it. Like when I realized that um, the executive director of new harvest was like a woman, my age mm. in Canada, like I was like, Oh my God, I should. Um, well, actually it was, this is such a long story, but um, <laughs> how I how I actually came to be connected to the New Harvest is because um, the guy who taught Asia Meat Science happened to also he happened to be a professor at the law school I was at at the time, and so right. just pure cosmic coincidence, um, I happened to be at the school that Isha did her undergrad in, and so it was just this like amazingly serendipitous thing that I crossed paths with the guy. I, I like. I basically like begged him to let me do an office hour with him and um and he he encouraged me to get in touch with Isha and I think just like like making that personal connection with with some of the people who are like basically behind cultured meat, I yeah. realized like okay, it's not a bunch of soup, it's not like it's not big food, you know mm. uh, it's not some big conspiracy theory, and so that was like probably the first like one of the first major um uh like glass shattering moments <laughs> yeah exactly like literally <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah or okay no not literally but figuratively <laughs> yeah. um, so so yeah um but yeah i guess the point i was trying to make is like i i also was a skeptic and i was disgusted and i like didn't want it to happen and if you had told me at the time that like years later i would be actually working in an organization that's doing this kind of research, I would not have believed you, but now here, but here I am. you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think that kind of informs why, like in my role in communications at New Harvest, like I can be a little bit of a hard ass. I'm not going to lie. Like I, um, like I like to take a critical stance on things and like, I also, you know, it's very important to also be optimistic and, and have a positive tone. And I am, of, of course. course, personally very excited about these things. But I also understand the perspective of the skeptic. And yeah. the skeptic is not going to be swayed by um, just unbridled enthusiasm. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like, you, you have to be real with them. Because if, if, I, if I, in my skepticism, was just told, oh, it's the best, it tastes amazing, and it's going to save the world, like, yeah. I would be like... You know, you're kind of laying it on a little thick there, and just be real. Yeah, it's that's got the I, whole that's, too that's good to I be I true want. vibe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, and and it's such a you know this the story that you're 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 telling about about New Harvest being a lot smaller than you thought it was, and mm -hmm. you know that's very much also kind of in contrast to you know as we were saying about the hype in the media you really get this impression that this industry yeah. is enormous right that it's kicking off yeah. that next year we're all going to be eating you know uh cultured yeah. meat burgers and that you know this is really <laughs> like the the silver bullet the quick quick fix solution that's going to end that's industrial gonna save agriculture the world. <laughs> right yeah and yeah. it's it's important yeah. hearing it you know uh, as it is and 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 mm -hmm. not yeah not putting it down like you're saying you you know you can be no not you can at all. be cautiously optimistic Exactly. I think that is like the kind of approach. That's a good description of, of I guess, like my approach. Because mm. um, I mean, I I am critical because I care. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, I do kind of. I hope it happens, but I I want it to. Like, let's not let's not let um you know what we want to be true, and you know how sometimes when you want something to be true, it's like. You want to, um, you can't help but kind of not be illogical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want it to be like that. You don't want to jinx it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess this kind of brings us on as well to, um, 
some of the other I guess the shortcomings or not not necessarily the shortcomings but I mean one of the things that when you kind of do manage to look past these sensationalist you know media headlines that are talking about mm -hmm. you know this being a solution mm -hmm. is that um as we touched upon is that it's not yet economically feasible and that it's very much a problem yeah. about about scaling it right about um yeah. you know we've made that 300,000 you know $330,000 burger but you know how are we yeah. going to make it a $3 burger how indeed yeah that's the question <laughs> and that's why we're funding um uh these research fellows and uh, there's four currently and and we're actively you know accepting proposals for more researchers to join the team and um and I mean we just don't know how how it is going to be scaled up but what mm. we do know for sure is that um we're gonna have to find a way to um have the cells grow in a medium that's sustainable um and unfortunately the current medium that's used um most of the time it's fetal bovine serum um and what is that exactly so just, like a, yeah yeah, so that's a byproduct of um, of the meat industry, and, and it's um, taken from when pregnant cows are slaughtered. Um, the ca the calf blood has this like incredible, um, you know, for some reason which we don't even understand scientifically. It has this ability, um, or it just there's something in it that cells love to grow in. Not just not just cultured meat cells, but even um, like in for all kinds of medical research, like there's something about, about fetal bovine serum that cells just love. And okay. so um, there's ongoing research, including new harvest uh, research, um, into why and, and how we can, like, come up with something that um, supplies, I guess, whatever that need is, mm. but in a more sustainable way. And, you know, there are, there are animal-free serums. There's all kinds of animal-free serums in existence, but... The, they're proprietary, and maybe you know that it's not. It doesn't contain um, an animal serum because I mean, there's also there's also horse serum and chicken serum and all kinds of other animal serums. Mm. Um, but but uh, you know, what else does it contain? And when it's going into your food, it's like you just don't know because those are like they're proprietary. Mm. So yeah, there's all there's like a huge challenge in in yeah. coming up with. Yeah, an appropriate medium for the cells to grow in. So, just before I forget, before we we talk about some of the other shortcomings, I mean, Memphis Meats has been getting a lot of media hype mm -hmm. recently as well, and 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 mm -hmm. I think it was last month or maybe even this month that they they came out with like a new chicken version, and yeah, and, and, and right, yeah. and they're and talking the about you know coming out with a product for consumers by twenty twenty one, or is that? I mean, is that yeah. realistic? Is that are they using I fetal bovine so. serum? How I many? really hope right. they can do it. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I don't know if it contained any serum. Um, I can't. I, you'd have to ask them because sure. um, they're a totally separate organization yeah. from us. Um, but I mean, yeah. I mean, if they can do it, yeah. I, I hope they can do it, and and. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't know <laughs> yeah. what else to say, but, but I mean, I definitely wish them the best yeah. in that. And I think it's really exciting that they were able to do the culture, uh, chicken and the duck. And Yeah, and they had um, a, a meatball as well. I mean, I, I checked yeah, out their yeah, website they quickly. Did, and, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so what what do you say? I mean, we've, we've, we've been quite, um, you know, quite critical here but but i think i think with good reason <laughs> but um what would yeah. you say to, to some of no definitely not i think i think <laughs> this is what people need they need a you know we need it's about mm -hmm. managing expectations <laughs> oh exactly yeah but for 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 i guess another criticism that i'm seeing out there and and, and this might yeah. be a, a quite reasonable one is that is that you know if if this is still all about hypotheticals and and in one yeah. way that's all about you know that that's all an, uh, that's a a good reason for funding it in the first place but other people say you know instead of putting my money you know in this hypothetical lab experiment wouldn't it be better yeah. you know spent supporting local farmers working with sustainable farming uh, um, yeah. you know and also just kind mm -hmm. of you know avoiding putting money into what, what to them seems like another, you know, corporation hijacking another industry. Right, right. Um, well, I guess, I mean, there are so many 
um, potential potential solutions out there for the future of food. Um, everyone, a lot of people are aware of like the challenges that lie ahead, you know, in, in sustainably and affordably um, feeding, feeding the world. Mm. And so supporting, I think, yeah, having like a diverse portfolio of options is a good idea. Yeah. And um, then like, yeah, if you're going to support, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing in any one of those potential solutions. And so, um, I mean, something kind of interesting is that new harvest, you know, we're often like associated with, um, like the insect pro- people who are doing insect protein and vertical farmers and like all of these kind of future future food solutions that are like a, a little bit out there. Mm. Um, and it's it's interesting. And I think that I guess it kind of makes sense because it it's probably not going to be just one of those things on its own that like quote unquote saves the world. Yeah, we're going to have to come up with like a lot of solutions, not even just for food, but or, you know, like I wonder, people are wondering about like, oh, how are we going to supply the demand for meat? And something that came, I mean, to my mind recently is like, I think the the need for um, water is is actually more urgent than the meat because, mm. I mean, you can you can live without meat if you have to, but you can't. You simply will not. You will die if you can't <laughs> have like drinkable water. You know what I mean? It's true. Um, and it's like a, it's a real concern. Um, and it's, it's like, a, we're going to have to have like kind of a multi pronged approach to, yeah. to all of this stuff. And so, um, you know, people who donate to new harvest, they, they donate to, to all kinds of other causes too. And, um, and so I, it's, I don't believe in like that whole all or nothing yeah. thing. Yeah. No, I think that's so true. We need, we need kind of a, a portfolio of solutions almost. And, and to kind totally, of yeah, yeah to, to counter that I mean it's not just food like so much is is changing you know in in res, in like response to like climate change and things mm-hmm. like that and some of it is like a change that's going to be forced upon you because you're just not going to be able to do things that you're that we took for granted before and some of it's going to be like preemptive yeah and I guess just this is such a potentially beneficial area that carries so much hope that, I mean, we, we just think that it's worth the inquiry now rather than when it's too late. Yeah, no, I agree. And and it's about, yeah, like with this, this, you know, this host of solutions, they're not necessarily, or they, they, we can't afford for them to, to be working against one another. It's not farmers versus cultured meat not it's not all. this versus that i mean they all have their role no. to play and 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 yeah and coming up with a kind of bigger solution yeah yeah okay maybe one Absolutely. final p- point aaron um for mm-hmm. those of you know the listeners out there that are interested in in doing something about this and either supporting new mm-hmm. harvest or or mm-hmm. or in doing their part for what is essentially still uh very much you know um a movement in its research phase and in its infancy yeah. what, what do you say to them mm-hmm. you know the easiest thing you can do is sign up for our newsletter and oh, nice. um just keep an eye on on what's going on um like i did too and um in the newsletter, you'll get updates about just what we're doing as an organization in general, updates about the field, um, what's going on in the research, and also like events that we that we're um, participating in. So we do a lot of speaking engagements and things like that. And we also have an annual um, cellular agriculture conference. So we started doing that last year. Um, there was such a like desire from the general public for like opportunities to actually meet the producers um, and the scientists. And um, just the, the people who are making um, things happen in, in this field. Mm. And so we had our first conference last year and our second one is in the works. Um, we don't have a date totally nailed down yet, um, okay. but I, I would just recommend signing up for a newsletter because everything will be announced there. But it'll be in the fall um, in October in New York. So um, if you can make it out, that would, it would be so awesome to have um, lots of people come out for that. And, um, and yeah, really, I mean, I'm a broken record on this, but the newsletter is like a must. Um, we get students and like just interested people coming to us all the time who Mm. say like, I want to get involved. I want to do this and that. And I'm just like, you know what, start with a newsletter (laughs) because it's a, this is a complicated, confusing space. And 
um, I think it's a, it's a good way to just like acclimatize yourself to yeah. everything that's going on. And like, you know, there's like jargon and there's, there's so many different players and, and like vocabulary and stuff that goes with this. And so I think just, um, getting familiar that way and like send me an email, you know, write, write to us and ask questions mm. and, and participate on like the social media and stuff. Like this is all, you know, cellular agriculture is not, there was a time when New Harvest was the only player around, but that's no longer the truth anymore. And it's, it's not going to be done by any one person or group. It's going to be a collaborative effort. And so, um, just get involved, you know, like, yeah. yeah. And that I think, yeah, just start with the newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. And, and, and people can yeah. sign up uh, to that by just going On to your website. website. Great. I'll put all yeah. of that in, in the description. New-harvest.org. New-harvest.org. Amazing. Thank you so great. much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Erin. It's, it's been great talking yeah. to you. Thank you. Yeah, I had uh, had a great time. Thank <laughs> you so much. As Aaron just mentioned, if you want to learn more about New Harvest, their approach, about cellular agriculture in general, or about cultured meat more specifically, then do check out their website and sign up to their newsletter. Of course, if you like this episode or any other For Food's Sake episode, the way you can support us is by rating and reviewing the show on iTunes, by subscribing, also by checking out the website, uh, the Facebook page, our Twitter and Instagram accounts, or just simply by sharing it with friends and family that you think might be interested in some of the topics we're covering. Okay, guys, that's it for now. I'll see you next week. 